Welcome to The Rich Report, a podcast with news and information on the world of big data. Today, my guest is from Teradata Labs. We have Scott now. Scott, you're, you're the president, are you not? Yes, sir. So Teradata Labs is actually the innovation engine of Teradata Corporation. So we invent, build, and bring to market all of the products that, that Teradata has in its uh, database and big data portfolio. Sure, sure. So, so, so what's your background, uh, Scott? Uh, I'm a data nerd. I've been doing this for uh, quite some time. In fact, uh, in the early days of data warehousing, I was a Teradata customer. And I came over and uh, into Teradata in 1995 and actually worked in our field organization implementing uh, databases and database technology and data warehouses for our customers. And about eight years ago, I had an opportunity to come be part of the, uh, the research development and engineering team and have been here ever since. Well, okay, so Scott, you've been around this space for a long time, and suddenly big data in the last couple of years seems to be all the buzz, and it seems to be synonymous with Hadoop. But I wanted to bring you on the show today to kind of put this in perspective. We have all these other kinds of technologies. I mean, how does, what is the ultimate role of Hadoop in the enterprise? Well, I think uh, stepping back for just one second, you're, you're absolutely right. There's, there's a lot of buzz in the industry about big data, and a lot of people try to tie that to a specific or discrete technology. And, and that's a little bit of a shame. You know, certainly big data is uh, a big thing in the industry, but we try to break it down into pockets. So for Teradata and our, our perspective and our customers, Big data is not about large data volumes. That's a, a problem that has come and gone and been solved, and that's where Teradata's unique parallel processing and architecture comes into play. But what most people mean when they talk about big data is new kinds of emerging data types that are created by sensor data, machine data, web log data, and, and other kinds of newer technologies that create this, this new kind of, of uh, data which lacks structure, which has new structures that people hadn't thought of even five years ago. And the technology to capture and harness and understand that data is a whole new frontier. Now, Hadoop is an enabling technology in this space in that it is a file system that allows customers to very easily and inexpensively store this new and emerging kind of data. And it, it allows them to store this new data in its native form which is a really, really important thing, okay? But it's only one piece of the puzzle. So it's an enabler for storage and capturing and, uh, and making it easy to uh, grab more data that have been created in an enterprise, but it's not the end game. It's not the only solution that's really important in this new age. Because just simply storing data isn't that interesting unless you can actually do something with the data that you've stored. So is it a matter of uh, integrating that kind of uh, capability with uh, enterprise type of data to, to make business decisions? Is that where you try to get? Well, certainly that's where, uh, that's where uh, we are centric in, in terms of Teradata's thinking and, and our business is really built around delivering analytics which create actionable information for our customers to better manage their business. Okay. So that's how we think. So just storing this data is only one step. Actually turning it into valuable, actionable information in real time is kind of the last mile of where the real value is in this whole new world order. So being able to extend existing technologies and, and extend the decision-making capabilities by taking advantage of real-time web log feeds or real-time machine data and enhancing the analytic for better decision is where the, the pile of, of value really shows up. And this, where does Teradata come in? Um, it, you're not just about storing and holding it. Do you give them ways to query, arrange, and uh, manipulate th this varied data? Absolutely, so that's actually our strategy. And what we have been rolling out recently is this notion of a unified data architecture. And a unified data architecture is simply a reference framework for how different kinds of data need to be stored, managed, moved, and uh, processed in an enterprise to deliver maximum value. 
Our unified data architecture includes Hadoop as a core and very important component because uh, the Hadoop file system and the data stored in a Hadoop file system can be in a huge amount of data that can be input into the overall process. But being able to integrate that into existing tools, existing technologies, and enterprise class systems is a really valuable component. So rather than having to build individual one-off applications from the ground up, customers who adopt a unified data architecture can simply take advantage of these new technologies and how they plug and play together with the existing infrastructure that they've deployed. And what that means is they can get that last mile of delivery to the desktop or to the handheld device of their business user who needs to make a decision using all of the systems that they've already deployed, but now delivering additional content which uh, is created from you know, Hadoop clusters and data stored in Hadoop, Hadoop clusters, as well as data stored in their traditional data warehouses, combining that together into a single process and then delivering that intelligence to the point of decision. So Scott, I've always been curious about this when you've got all this kind of uh, unstructured data coming in, do you have to force fit that into like a columnar database or something to be able to work with it? Absolutely not. Uh, the unified data architecture actually one of the key components is that you 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 store the data and you store the data in in its native format because anytime you force a structure or force a taxonomy on on a data element, you're changing the data, and you can never get back to the original detail that was contained in that data structure. So the unified data architecture basically says play the data as they are. Uh, as the data come in in, in native format, and then, um, and then from there, you can actually define and understand paths and relationships uh, and interactions between different parts of the business based on the detailed data in the native format. So there are a lot of vendors out there talking about, uh, you know, their big data platform is an in-memory columnar database. And mm -hmm. while that certainly is interesting technology, I think that's force-fitting into a solution that those vendors want to sell rather than keeping uh, the data in the native format, which over time we have proven shows the best value for our customers. So, you know, I, I always, when people ask me about big data, uh, I try to describe what structured is versus unstructured, and the analogy I like to use is, is music CDs, right? Um, there's, there was billions of these things printed out with all kinds of different titles but the data wasn't really structured on it. It was just, you know, file one, two, three, four, five, six. And then something I think was called CDDB, let people kind of enter in what the names of the songs were. Is that a good example of what's happening out there is there's this data that's just kind of unlabeled and continually growing? Yeah, you're actually talking about a notion that's called late binding. Mm. And, and that, that is the, the, the core concept behind it. So stepping back just a little bit as a, you know, I told you in my introduction, I'm a data nerd, right? Mm -hmm. So all data has structure, right? So anybody who says that big data is unstructured data, it, it's an oxymoron because all data actually does have structure. The, the real nuance is in this notion of late binding. So I don't know if you've uh, seen this latest invention that's out there. Uh, it's all the rage in, in some circles. It's called a Litro camera. Yes. And the difference between a Litro camera and your old Nikon, or my old Nikon that uh, I use, right, is that with a Nikon, you, you set up the frame and, and, and you focus it and you set up the, the picture and you take the picture and you're done, right? With a Litro camera, you just kind of point that camera at something and, you, and it takes millions of pictures simultaneously and when you get back later, you can decide which one you want, right? Mm -hmm. That's late binding. That's the notion of late binding. Okay. Big data is kind of a late binding thing. So if you, if you store it all in its native format, you can decide later how you want to bind it. And so the example that you gave of, uh, of the, the CD tracks, file one, file two, and then late binding, deciding what the name of the track is later, that is an example of late binding. By the way, all of that data actually had structure. It's not unstructured. It's just that you, you, you change your mind on the schema later. And there's a lot of power in that from two perspectives, right? One is certainly with the Litro camera, you may decide that you want to have a near field um, focus versus a long field focus. And then you get back to the office and you're like, wow, you know, the, having, having the near field be out of focus is a much better photograph. So you can change your mind as you see different things or as you understand different things about the data. And that's really the power behind big data. And that's why 
by the way, it's really, really, really important to enable Hadoop in an infrastructure because it lets you keep all of that detailed data, just like all of those millions of photographs in a Litro camera, and you can decide and do your binding later. So how do we rein in this, this is like uncoordinated data and all this gathering, how do we rein that in? Well, again, that's why, uh, that's why we're really working on this notion of the unified data architecture, because certainly with A, any new technology, and B, any technology where you have the notion of late binding, it's very easy to have things spiral out of control and be uh, uncoordinated across an enterprise, right? And that would be bad, because it would be a loss of, of value. So the notion that uh, we came up with with our reference architecture is not so much uh, uh, to you know, sell Teradata technology, although of course we like to do that. It's really about ha helping our customers to make sense of all of the different technologies, all of the different use cases, and all of the different data options that they have. And then they can fill in the blanks of how they want to coordinate those things together. All right? So it's really about coordination and not defining standards. And we, where we have worked with customers to date with our unified data architecture, they've been very excited about it because it helps them make sense of all of the different options. And it doesn't force a decision on a specific technology or a specific application, but it at least provides a framework for how these different applications and technologies might fit together. So, so Scott, you being a, a data nerd and you've got, you've got to work with different IT parts of the company, uh, how do you even get your terminology straight inside within different lines of business? Well, you know, that's less about technology and more about the internal politics of a business. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I think about it from the days when I was uh, in implementation for our customers, right, um, uh, standardization of a taxonomy or um, definitions of master data and those kinds of things, the technology to do that is actually quite easy, and in fact, with the with the emerging technology in uh, in the Hadoop, MapReduce, and in that space, makes it even easier. The hard part is getting business owners to actually agree, and so that's where you know, as a company, we've actually invested very heavily in our professional and consulting services organization, where we can actually be a trusted advisor and third party to our customers to help them resolve those internal conflicts and come back with an agreement on what those common terms and standards should be. But in, in my mind, it's less about the technology and more about uh, the business decision that needs to be made on standardization. So, so uh, Scott, you bring up this, this issue of trust, and I was just reading some uh, headlines from the Kaspersky uh, conference here. I mean, how can we be sure about this data when it comes in from all these places? How can we trust it? You know, it's, uh, it, it's interesting. Um, there are a couple of aspects of trust, but I think, I think really the biggest aspect of trust is that in this big data world, it's a little bit different than the traditional data world that we think about. In that, if I'm if I'm consolidating a general ledger to publish my P&L for a public company, I've got to absolutely 100% trust the data, and it's got to be accurate. I can't lose any data. It's got to be 100% there, and it's got to be auditable, right? That's the way those kinds of things work, right? If I'm looking at customer sentiment and I'm sampling a million customers and the languages they and the language or the linguistics that they use in comments that they make on social network sites, and I only get 98% of the sample, that's probably okay. And I can probably still trust the answer that I get from it because it's a very fuzzy kind of correlation that I'm trying to look for to determine sentiment. So in the big data space and in some of the newer applications, trust is very important. Obviously, you have to trust the sanctity of the data and make sure that, they're, uh, that, the, that the data have been delivered properly. But at the same time, you're solving for a different problem. And when you're looking for uh, more loosely coupled relationships, uh, trust becomes a very different kind of concept. Um, trust, I think, turns more into privacy and trust than uh, trust of the, of the sanctity of the specific data. So, you know, we, we, when we bring this together and you've got this unified structure, Scott, uh, um, do I have to, uh, you know, just get the forklifts and take out everything I had, or does this provide an umbrella above um, the IT infrastructure? Well, the, the way we see it is it's really adjacent to existing technologies, and there, there are new adjacent technologies that fit into this go-forward kind of app, um, application architecture and data architecture. The thing that I do think will happen, and there are a lot of industry analysts who are already talking about this, is I think in another, uh, you know, I'm not a really good uh, prognosticator, but 
let's say in a year or two years or three years, sometime in the future, we will no longer be talking about big data. We'll just be talking about data. And people will come to realize that big data is really interesting, but it's really simply a part of the, the overarching data architecture uh, that companies have. And the, the, the advent of some of these newer technologies simply gives them new tools and new techniques to take advantage of data that A, didn't exist before, and B, can add value to their decision-making capabilities. So um, I think it will kind of merge into just data architecture. I don't think it's a forklift. I think it's an, an addition to. And, and it's just like... Um, you know, just like building a house, right? It's, there, there are new tools, right? Hadoop yeah. is a new tool. MapReduce yeah. is new tools. Bob, it's it's new tools, right? Uh, and so, you know, you could build a house with uh, with a hammer and a saw, but you know, if you had a level and if you had you know a, a forklift and you had all these other tools, you could build it faster and more efficiently, and it would probably be better overall. It's the same thing in this space. We have new tools, new technologies that handle new use cases, and figuring out how to make them all work together is where the pot of gold is. Well, great, Scott. I guess kind of a wrap up here. You know, when you, when you start to engage customers about uh, your offering from Teradata, is is there some re-education involved, or do they they already know they have a problem that they're not uh, adequately addressing? Um, it varies. Yeah. So we have customers who are driving the leading edge of of the advent of big data and big data technologies, and so our um, consultation and advice with them is very different than than customers who are late adoption uh, late adopters of new, of new and emerging technologies so it runs the gamut uh, but in general we uh, across that that entire spectrum we get a lot of very positive feedback on just stepping back into a reference architecture and defining how the different pieces fit together and providing a roadmap for our customers on how th how they can implement when they decide how they can implement these different components and ensure that those different components will work towards a common goal. And and then just to wrap up, Scott, I, um, I mean, how uh, how much of an engagement is is involved to kick the tires on this and see if it's right for for my application? So one of the things that we see, especially for late adopters and late adopters who are looking at some of these newer technologies like our discovery platform, which is uh, from Astrodata or or our uh, big analytics um, uh, applications. I would say 90% of those customers actually engage us in a proof of concept where they're like, yeah, we kind of get it that there's this data, we kind of get it that there's something we can learn from it, but, but we, we want your help to show us. And so we see a lot of that uh, kind of discovery mode proof of concept uh, for those customers. Uh, we have other customers, especially in the uh, internet space and in the e-business space, who have already figured it out and they're looking to our tools just to, to figure out how to make things run more efficiently. Uh, so it comes from those two perspectives, but the lion's share of the market really is in the proof of concept kind of show me space right now. And we're showing up and showing them, uh, everyone that I've seen so far, we've come up with a, an aha moment that they didn't know before. And, and that uh, you know our customers have said, wow, this this is really great, and uh, and we need to proceed forward and build out our architecture. Well, great. Well, Scott, now I want to thank you once again for uh, telling us about this, and uh, thanks again for coming on the show today. My pleasure. Thank you. You bet. Okay, folks, that's it for the Rich Report. Stay tuned for more news and information on the world of big data.